itself. Well, I was very impressed when I visited your place and, and, and saw you going through the, uh, the assembly there and, and the various uh, ways you'd set that thing up, and it's uh, really impressive, the, the special machinery you have for putting those things together and the way you take those tabs and uh, use them, it's, it's just terrific. And I'm delighted that you guys are doing this right here in Michigan and, in fact, in Troy. Well, the, as a matter of fact, Senator, we prepared a short video that shows a simulation of how these batteries are put together. The first thing you'll see in this video are the cells being put together to form a module, and then you'll see how the modules are put together into a pack, and all the wiring, the electronics, and cover is added. It's rather short if we want to play it. Yeah, let's do it. It's, not a, it's the next best thing to being there, as they say, so I uh, look forward to it. Okay, let's show it. That's the, that's the end. So uh, what we were trying to, to show there was, uh, was that, uh, you know, beyond the cells, the, the pack is quite a bit of work. Um, quite a bit of labor and jobs are involved in uh, that's you know, good from news the, from in the module level up. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and then as Damien said, when we get to actually starting to bring cell production in Michigan, uh, that can take the form of several steps as well. It doesn't have to be an entire cell plant as we, as we start to bring in the electrodes uh, assembly. Uh, and then all the way to the raw materials. Well, listen, I, I'm very impressed with you guys. I should warn you, though, however, as this thing takes off, competition is going to show up. They want to do the same thing, and that's healthy, and I think you guys will do just fine in any competition. But again, I want to remind our audience, in the end, it's those things right there, the cells that have to be made in this country, uh, if, in fact, we don't wind up with the same situation we have now with petroleum in the Middle East. And this sort of leads me into the next thing I want to talk about. And uh, as we go more and more to uh, electric cars and more use of electricity, uh, although people don't want to hear this, we're probably going to need more coal-fired electrical generating plants uh, because of the increased demand until a lot of the alternatives catch on. Now, the bad thing with the uh, with uh, coal-fired plants is the CO2, the carbon dioxide that comes out of it. So I brought a couple slides to talk about a way that we're going to get rid of these, uh, uh, the problem with CO2 and pollution. And so that takes me to the question of what do we do about getting rid of all that CO2 that we all hate? Well, the answer is algae. And what is it that algae can do for Michigan? I'm using the Bell River coal-fired plant in St. Clair for the data that you're going to see in this presentation. And that coal-fired plant at Bell River produces 18 million tons of CO2 a year. Now, CO2 doesn't weigh that much. You can imagine what the volume is. Nearby, there's a sewage disposal plant that puts out 400,000 gallons of water a day. And what they do after they get the gunk out of it, that's a scientific term, as you know. Uh, then they introduce chlorine into the water to kill the bacteria, and they throw the whole thing back into the river. Now, instead of using chlorine, you use ultraviolet light. Not a new technology. It's been used all over the world. Now you have fairly clean water, and it's clean enough to host algae. And you take this water and put it into a huge algae-producing facility. Now, when I say huge, it's about three football fields long. There are three towers in it filled with tubes now about 400 feet long, filled with water. That 200,000 gallons that fill this thing in a week. And to give you an idea of the size, in the left-hand side of this 
little chart here, you see one of the three towers, and next to it is the footprint of the Rensen. This is not a small facility. And in that facility, which runs 24 hours a day, day and night, seven days a week, you control light, air, and the water, and you introduce scrub CO2, and you turn that CO2, which is a liability, into an asset. And that 18 million tons of CO2 becomes 5 million tons of algae. And it can have all kinds of uses. It can uh, produce fuel pellets, uh, which would supplement the uh, coal that's being burned in the uh, coal-fired plant. That, 18, that 5 million tons of algae can produce 85 million tons of biodiesel, 134 million tons of ethanol, oxygen, goes back to the power plant and it's like a blacksmith bellows on the fire, and you wind up with three and a half million tons of algae residue that is edible. It's what you wrap sushi rice in. Now we wouldn't feed it to people right away, but that's the kind of energy and other uh, byproducts you can get out of this thing. And algae is 500 times better than corn for producing fuel. Clean water goes back into the river. The only water loss that occurs is evaporation. Now, there are carbon credits you hear about uh, in Europe. We don't have them yet here, but basically it, it controls the amount of carbon dioxide you can let loose in the air, and if you produce less, you can sell the difference from what your quota is to somebody else. Now, if the Bell River plant gets rid of just half the CO2, it'll get paid $216 million a year for doing it. Now, once this process gets going, it ain't going to be $38 a ton anymore, but the point is, one of the uh, uh, presidents, I was talking to the presidents of uh, Consumers Power and DTE, and they said, man, that factory's going to cost half a million dollars. I said, yeah, you, two years with no carbon credits. <laughs> now you can use the paper industry, cosmetic industry, pharmaceuticals. I took the 100 largest CO2 producers in the country. One and a half billion tons of CO2, that could give us 20% of our fuel production. Right here in this country, for all those batteries you guys are going to be making. This has the potential to do for the energy industry what Henry Ford did with the automobile. He didn't invent the automobile, he just, the automobile, he just figured out how to make a lot of them. And one of these facilities, 9,000 people in it. They're watching light, heat, energy, water, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if we don't do it, somebody else will. Now there's a whole new industry there. We got all these tool and die makers now mm -hmm. out of work. They'd be making centrifuges, lighting, pumps, components. And the genius behind this is the, uh, Bob Truxell who is Sequest Corporation. Bob was the general manager of General Dynamics Land Systems, and I was his director of business and strategic planning. I left there in 91. Hadn't seen him for years. And he called me up, he said, John, I have this process. I don't know how to bump up with the government. I said, well, come, let me see what you have. When I saw what he had, I said, we want it in Michigan. We want to put all those tool and die makers back to work. Now the thing is, every piece in that huge factory will fit on a 40-foot trailer and you can send it anywhere in the world. This guy knows how to make stuff. He's a car guy, and so are the people around him. Now, if you're in the manufacturing business, as you guys are, you know there's a thing called proof of concept. When the engineers throw those drawings and the clay models over the transom to manufacturing, it takes two and a half, three years before you can figure out where the welds go, the wiring, and do all the testing and so forth. This thing is ready for proof of concept. 